Hello, welcome to Feature in a Short. We've got a new theme song for you, Loopster by Kevin McLeod. My name is Justin Joseph Hall, the owner of Four Wind Films. This podcast is a monthly screening where an appointed contributor presents their chosen feature motion picture and a short movie. There is only one condition for the screening selection. The presenter must have been directly involved with one picture, but not the other. This week's contributor is John Alpert, a very well-established, Oscar-nominated documentarian and journalist for over 40 years. John Alpert is an amazing storyteller. He founded DCTV with Keiko Tsuno and is an inspiration to me and many other filmmakers. He helped me kick off my career as I worked on a film... John directed along with Matthew O'Neill called Rock in a Hard Place, which was the first feature-length film that I worked on from beginning to end in post-production. On top of all of his accomplishments, um, being behind the camera, uh, in person he's quite a character and, and very fun to be around, and uh, he always makes the workplace entertaining. For today's two films, the first director is Jasmine Barclay with When Life Hands You Lemons. Jasmine was part of the DCTV program, Pro TV run by Johnny Ramos, Sharif Felimita, and Jesse Perez Antigua. The school teaches youth in New York who aren't as privileged how to make films and how to use the equipment from concept to shooting, editing, and to the sound mix. And it's all free to them. So if, if you'd like to learn more about that, please, um, we'll include it in our link. Support them any way you can. It's a great program. Uh, there was this kid, Jamaican kid from way, way in Brooklyn someplace, uh, and I noticed he had a, a, a bulge in his lower pant leg, his socks, one day. And I asked him what it was. And he pulled out this huge butcher's knife. I said, oh, really? What's that for? <laughs> and uh, he had to fight his way through the gangs in order to get to our class. Uh, and he wanted to come to our class so much that he was willing to, to bring a butcher's knife uh, in, in order to make it. So uh, this is often a transformative opportunity for the kids, but normally you want to hide things like uh, your parents being incarcerated or the fact that you might be homeless. And this particular filmmaker was homeless for the entire time that she was here at DCTV. So there's hundreds uh, and hundreds of autobiographical films. It, it's been um, constructed into a series called Our Cameras, Our Stories. Uh, it was Emmy nominated. The kids didn't win, but the kids have won uh, local Emmys and beaten the pros on a number of occasions. That's really cool. What made you choose this one in particular? Well, we're talking about revealing a deeply personal components of your life, things that you normally might not share with other people, uh, but shape your identity, who you are. And that's the theme of the films that we're showing tonight. And so this is Jasmine telling the world that she's homeless uh, while she's going to high school and keeping a stiff upper lip. You're afraid of your secrets and you're not afraid of what you tell people. And uh, we believe that when you embrace who you are, uh, it strengthens you and makes you into the superheroes that our high school kids are. And that's why it's part of the program. You've got to do it, otherwise you don't graduate. When you started DCTV, though, did you have the school in mind first? Well, we had uh, always the educational program, but it was primarily for the equivalent of our peers, for local adults, because mm -hmm. we only had one camera. And there were a thousand stories to be told, and uh, we were working 24 hours a day, but we couldn't put a dent in it. So we figured if we deputized everybody and we taught them how to do what we knew how to do, we would loan anybody our equipment. And we did it without charge, and we would do whatever we could to encourage people to tell their stories and the stories of our neighborhood. But we didn't have classes specifically for kids until they shut down all these educational programs in the high schools. Who's shooting? Other kids? Other kids, program. yeah. And is it like a team or does everybody help? Sometimes, some, sometimes the kids do everything themselves. Uh, and sometimes they uh, solicit the help of other classmates. But what's important in this program, this is uh, all 100% baked by the kids. Uh, so they do everything. And they do the shooting, they do the editing, um, they conceive of the story. And there are other programs in which the kids sort of are standing in front like marionettes and the adults are pulling the strings. And that's not what we want to do. Uh, the program starts very simply. The kids learn to do a, a public service announcement. Then they start working collaboratively on issues that affect their lives. It could be gang violence, it could be teen pregnancy. There's one story about a girl who became pregnant 
while she was here, and it's, it's a story of what she's deciding to do and why she's deciding to do it. What we had last year uh, was one about a kid who supported Trump, uh, especially because of Trump's stand on guns. The kid's dad loved guns, and it's his realization that these guns have killed his peers. And during a time of uh, school shootings, he realizes that people to the left of him and people to the right of him could have easily been killed by these type of weapons. And so it's a very interesting transformation in his political observations. So after we watched the film, we had a short discussion. We tried to get Jasmine, and uh, we had a few people try to reach out and contact her. We didn't get a hold of her, so do you know where she is now? And um, So her dad got out of jail, and the two of them resumed like father-daughter living in the same place. And it wasn't easy for the father because he wanted to be a strict disciplinarian because he thought that, that that's how uh, he could be a good father. But he was dealing with a daughter that had uh, achieved her own independence. So I think there was a little bit of friction there in the beginning, but I understand that they got over it and they have a good relationship. And her dad went to jail uh, because of very, very strict gun laws that were enacted around the time. He was working in construction. Uh, he had a responsible position. Sometimes the position involved him carrying around money for the head of the construction company. And I think that uh, there was some confrontation where people tried to rob him and he had a gun. He was more like a defendant in the situation, but he wound up doing a very, very long prison stretch with a mandatory minimum. Uh, but Jasmine not only went to college, uh, I think she's got her master's now and has a kid and has been to DCTV uh, from time to time. And what goes on here is that kids that have gone through the program come back and help fertilize the next generation of kids and also teach them. I would say that the staff of our Pro TV program, especially the teachers, uh, three out of four of them are, are kids that graduated and are back to, to give back to the next generation. Did she end up uh, working in film or what did she end up? Well, I think she was in social work. Thank goodness uh, these kids all don't become filmmakers. We all, we all, we all know what that, that life is like. So I think she was involved in social, social work. What year was this film? five or six years ago, because this was just when she was going away to school, so she would have finished her four years and gotten her master's. So There are other similar films. Uh, so in the our cameras, our stories, you'll see lots of this. And there are kids that, that you pass in the hallway that you have no idea what their background is. That's what she says in her first line. If you pass me on the street, you will have no idea what I've been going through. I know what these kids have gone through because I've seen their films, but you don't, and they're all here at DCTV every single day. Film, filmmaking was a tool. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it was a tool of uh, social activism and, and improvement. We wanted to improve life uh, in our neighborhood. And we were spectacularly unsuccessful. Uh, we were doing community organizing, fighting for better schools, fighting for better hospitals, fighting for better housing, and we weren't winning any of these things. We were fighting against the Vietnam War. The war was chugging along. Um, I was uh, driving a taxi cab, and I was uh, working uh, as a rank-and-file union activist trying to improve the conditions for the drivers, failing. And then one day, Keiko had been experimenting with video but as, as artwork, uh, and I asked to borrow her camera and made a short video documenting all the, the really almost deathly conditions uh, of driving a taxi cab in those days. It's very hard to organize taxi drivers. Taxi drivers are independent workers. It's not like all the workers in the factory against the boss. It's every driver against the other drivers. Uh, I'll cut you off and you'll cut me off in order to pick Sasuke up uh, on the corner. And you can't organize them. We showed this uh, video and it was like waving a magic wand over everybody. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to work together. All of a sudden, we took the garage over. All of a sudden, all our candidates began getting in. And this was like, this was a magic potion. And when we made a short documentary about the corruption in our school district that nobody had been able to overcome, they threw the corrupt school board out. And when we made a documentary about the need to have a community control of the hospital, we got community control of the hospital. I mean, the, you know, it, it was within the context of other things, but it was a very, very important component for social change. And we, we, we held on with both hands. We showed our films in the street from an old mail truck, the sort of original portable drive-in movie theater, and we'd park because uh, there was no cable TV, there was no internet, uh, and there wasn't anybody that touched anything that was made by independents. So we parked on the corner of Canal and Center Street and, and show our films, and I gotta tell you that uh, there is no crueler but better teacher than an empty sidewalk. What drew you to video? 
uh, originally like a lot more more than film and poverty and championing. poverty and <laughs> low intelligence uh, because um, you you needed some form of education in order to be able to work in film. You needed to understand stuff that we didn't understand. Video, you turn the switch on, you point the camera, you roll it back, and, and it's there. It's, it, it's a completely different medium. And all the film people were snobs, and they disparaged us and spit on us because we worked in video. I only tried working in film once. First of all, it cost money for the film stock. Mm. And it cost money to develop it. And I think it was probably 20 bucks for the film stock and $20 to develop it. That was a lot of money in those days. That was almost two weeks salary. Uh, and nothing came out, it was all black. <laughs> and and uh, I was uh, discouraged enough so that I never touched film again and uh, figured that uh, there might be a lot of problems. And there were very, very serious problems with the video technology in those days the sort of level of learning in video was very, very low in those days. It wasn't anybody that knew more than we did, but there were, everybody in the film world knew everything. You know from being around me here at DCTV, sort of planning an organization is not necessarily my, my strong suit. Uh, there are other people here that are very good at it, but I'm an improviser. Um, video is well suited for that. If you're, if you're disorganized like me, but sort of improvisational, you're screwed making film. Uh, but with video, you're fine. You know, if it didn't work out, you roll the tape back, you start over. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and it's a, it's a spontaneous medium as opposed to film, which is a very structured medium. Um, and that's why me and film guys, um, you know, like circle each other warily in the same room. But you've had experience in narrative film. Well, nothing good, you know. <laughs> I had, I had two runs at narrative filmmaking. So the first one, this is, this is uh, the time of the Sundance Film Festival. So I went through a patch where, where all the documentary films we were making were, were not ending well for our characters. We would follow drug addicts and every time they seemed to be sort of climbing their way up, they would slip back, wind up in jail, uh, people dying in front of our cameras. Um, and I was pretty depressed. But that was reality, and that's the reality of documentary filmmaking, is you can't control the story. Uh, the story controls itself. Um, I wrote a story uh, called South Bronx Drama, in which uh, a group of abused tenants took over their building in the South Bronx, and this was during the time when the South Bronx was on fire, uh, and battled off evil landlords and city officials to build something for themselves. And I got selected to go out to the first Sundance class that they had there, sort of Bob Redford's High School on the Mountain. And I was the only person that had never done anything like this before. My script, so to speak, was, it was probably like about 700 pages. And, and when, I, when, I, when, when I thumped it down on the table, you know, everybody looked at me and I was like the kid who wore the wrong clothes to school. It was very, very embarrassing. Uh, but I didn't know what a, the, the right script was supposed to be. And let's, who knows who Carl Malden is? Okay, so Carl Malden, he had to have won an Oscar probably for On the Waterfront as Best Supporting Actress. He's the priest in On the Waterfront, uh, Streets of San Francisco. And Streetcar, Streetcar Named Desire. Desire. Right. Okay, so he, he was uh, a, a great American actor and he was my roommate uh, at, at Sundance. And he says, um, John, this isn't a script. <laughs> He says, but um, if you'll work hard, I'll help you. So I would stay up all night long working on the script, especially the things that he had suggested. And uh, if, if that script wasn't on the table when he got up for his coffee, both of us would have been really disappointed. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the week, it got down to the standardized 125 pages uh, and all the annotations were in the right spot and I had a script. I didn't know how to you know, work with actors. I had no idea what I was doing and I was terrified. And everybody else thought they were like the next big time director and they all had ascots and mustaches. And the um, first thing I did was I shaved off my mustache because I just didn't want to be like these guys. And I began working with the actors. And the nice thing about documentary filmmaking is that you might not have the, the sort of linguistic ability and the experience of working with actors, but you know what the truth is. And, and, and you can go through the scenes that you're working on and just point, you know, this, this doesn't feel <coughs> real, but this feels quite real. And so sort of by necessity, I was one of the first directors to, to work with video and work with the actors that way. 
And we sat around watching um, all the takes and talking about them. The buzz went over the mountain that there's this weird guy who's directing in a very interesting way. And all the actors from the other movies began coming over and asking if they could come into mine. Mm -hmm. So Morgan Freeman uh, left the one that he was in. He, he hated the, the guy that was directing him. Uh, Christopher Guest uh, and we, 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 we <laughs> you know, and I and I modified the the, 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 the the script in order to work them all in, and some of these famous actors couldn't act. They could, they just couldn't. I'm not going to tell you of those three that I've mentioned which one couldn't act, but one of those <laughs> could not act. The two of them really were good. So we get to the uh, end of the month, and Redford decides that the first. Um, director that he's bringing to Hollywood to make the first Sundance film is me. So I go to Hollywood <laughs> with Redford. And because he's Redford, I get meetings with like really big shots at all the studios. But in reality, nobody wants to do this movie because there are no white people in the lead. The cops are the villains. Uh, this type of movie is fine now, but in those days, the, no way it's getting made. And, and this became obvious at Paramount. I think it was Paramount, where they this new whippersnapper vice president it watches this and because uh, I had like a 10 minute sample and he says well we everybody loves to do that we'd love to make this movie and we love everything that you're doing and we love this and we love that but we can't do this because um, you know you don't have any experience and uh, if you had a really experienced uh, executive producer somebody like Redford of course which you couldn't get Redford I mean we just love to do this I said well, I can get Redford <laughs> and the guy goes <laughs> and uh -oh, now what do I do? Yeah, so I get, I get home, the phone's already ringing, right? And it's the kid. And he goes, please, 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 you know, and he's begging me, don't ask Redford, because uh, he must have found a Redford, like this is exactly what Redford wants to do, is he wants to get this movie made. So uh, Redford and I meet the next day, and he says, John, um, it's not so easy, I and mean, this, this is what Hollywood is really like. Um, and everybody's two-faced, and the, the guy's going to tell you he loves your movie. It's going to take us, we'll get it made, but it's going to take two years. In those days, luckily it's not the situation, now DCTV was 150% um, dependent upon my income and the money that I was making. And at this time, uh, I was on the Today Show all the time. And all the money that the Today Show paid uh, went into DCTV and supported all their programs. And with me cavorting around Hollywood and hanging around with all these actors and actresses, uh, the DCTV trajectory was not good. And I had a and as existential moment there in which I had to decide what I was going to do and was I going to hold hands with these nice Hollywood people and uh, try to become Mr. Show Business or was I going to come back to my real love, my true love, which was DCTV. And um, so I said, uh, you know, I've thought about it, Bob, I'm going back to New York. And, and he could not understand that. Really? Uh, because the people in Hollywood, you know, Bob Redford, for all the nice things that he's done and for all the democratization uh, of filmmaking that Sundance uh, has, has allowed, is a Hollywood person. And everything in his life is built around Hollywood and accomplishing something in Hollywood and sort of defied the way in which he looked at the world that I would turn my back on it. But I did, and I'm pretty happy. I actually did, I, I, I worked on... Um, an Alan Pakula film called Rollover. So Alan Pakula did All the President's Men, Clute. He, he had an office in, in where Trump Tower is now on the Central Park West was the um, Gulf Western Paramount building. Um, and he had an office that was bigger than the studio. It had a carpet that like, like you sank your knees into. <laughs> And, and he had his tea at a specific temperature. If his temperature wasn't like right, I mean, he would like throw a fit. And I sat there and, you know, me and Keiko had been on the cover of American uh, Filmmaker or something like that as the sort of the, the, the new kids uh, on the block in terms of filmmaking. And he was making this movie with uh, Chris Christopherson and Jane Fonda called Rollover. And uh, this movie, was about um, a fiscal crisis in which the Saudis, who controlled all of the American debt and capital, got angry about something and refused to roll over the loan and continue their funding, and the world fell apart. And he wasn't doing a good job directing this movie. Uh, and, and everybody knew it except him. And so the plan of the executive producer was to, to bring me in there and in 
a three minute capsule at the end of the film where the world falls apart is a sort of faux newscast uh -huh. in, in which you see uh, riots in the street and mm -hmm. the Pope uh, begging for everybody to just work together and they figured this would save the movie and that we would, we would save it. And Alan Bakula asked me, you know, young man, you know, what makes you think that uh, you could work on a movie? And I told him that, uh, well, I've done documentaries and documentaries is sort of like a one note solo, one instrument, but movies like a symphony with all these different things. I could see him lighting up and he really liked this. And so he decided that he was going to direct George Page. Uh, the next day, I'm going to show this whippersnapper. <laughs> so we set the whole thing up, and uh, he comes in. They do one take. Bakula is like walking out, and everybody's looking around. It was horrible. So I said, George, what do you think? He goes, well, it's terrible. I don't know what to do. I said, well, are you happy with it? He says, no. I said, well, let's do it again, right? So I redirected it. I give him some the whatever motivation. You know, I'm whispering in his ear and stuff like that. Well, Bakula is like halfway off the door, and he turns and he sees this. And evidently, um, he went right to the executive producer and he says, no one ever directs on an Alan Bakulin set except Alan Pakula. And so we're, you know, I've done what I thought was this great, great uh, uh, version of, the, of this scene and we're putting it all together. It's two o'clock in the morning, boom, the doors open up and in comes the executive producer like it's a drug raid uh, and stop the machines and they seize all the tapes and like pile them up into cardboard boxes and um, so was that my second experience with Hollywood, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the first time I'd ever been fired, uh, and I got fired from the job. Did they use your footage in the end? Yeah, yeah, it's the oh, end of the did. movie. Yeah, it is the So, so if you can ever see um, Rollover, Rollover the last uh, three minutes or a DC TV production. <laughs> and, and it was all shot on videotape, and this was also uh, very unusual. Um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola was experimenting with video, but nobody had u actually used video uh, in the production of a Hollywood film, and this was the first time it was done. Uh, just one other thing. If that's how you got into video, what brought you to Sundance and Redford then? With so the it was the frustration with the way reality was turning out. And um, I was saddened by the unhappy endings of life's reality. Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes the stories that we were doing were very poignant, uh, sometimes depressing stories because we were uh, pointing our finger at uh, things in America that needed to be improved, things in the world that needed to be improved, and there's tragedies wrapped up in that. And, and what year, just to put it in context, what, what year in New York? In the late 70s. Late 70s. Late 70s. And it went, when you're making films and um, documentary making, one of the important things that you have to do is you have to basically convince people to to share with you and then share with millions of people uh, because in those days so uh, we had a very large audience on the Today Show you know since I, I'm not that clever the material needed to to have this sort of extraordinary intimacy and rawness that nobody else had been able to get in order for NBC to break its rules and to allow a, an independent wacko like me to have access to their airways because they they did not allow the, I'm, I'm the lone exception in the history of NBC News of an outsider being able to be part of did they NBC come News to you or did you go to them with Vietnam footage uh, you know it happened accidentally you know, we were we were blacklisted, and my dream was to be a, a PBS documentary filmmaker because that's all I knew. But we managed to make a series of documentaries that were very well received on Channel 13 uh, until we got blacklisted. And uh, again, George Page, we, we had figured out that the Vietnamese and the Chinese were going to go to war together. We had access to Vietnam and could get in and out of Vietnam when nobody else could. And we were the first American reporters to go to Vietnam and get into Vietnam after the war. Uh, first to get into Cambodia. We, we discovered the killing fields. And George said, gee, I don't know what to do. I used to work for NBC. Um, I, I know the guy who runs their news division. He called him up and, and, and sent me and Keiko over. We were standing in front of the elevators at 30 Rockefeller uh, Center. And the guy looked at us and you know, basically we were cannon fodder. And he says, yeah, why not? And he sent us off because they couldn't get in. And he figured he would take a chance. Um, and the amount of money that I decided to charge them was less 
than all the expense. We lost money like for the first uh, two years that we worked for NBC because I was so stupid. I didn't like know how to deal with them and, and make these calculations. <coughs> Uh, but we got in, and um, it was one of these situations where life was, was exploding. And if you could just hold on to yourselves and keep your camera focused at it, you, you, could, you could make a, a report. Now, I was really dumb and stupid, and, and um, I, I began imitating what I had seen on TV. And you know, we're walking out uh, into this, the northernmost town in Vietnam, with the Chinese uh, sharpshooters and snipers uh, sitting on the hills there. And two days before, they had killed this uh, Japanese reporter who was dumb enough to be doing what we were doing. And they start shooting. And I'd never been in, under gunfire before. I come, I come from here. And it was pretty scary, but you know, I got very excited. And I grabbed the microphone, and I did what I thought you're supposed to do under those circumstances, which is a stand-up. <laughs> and, and everybody's screaming, they're going, John, get back, get back, John, get back, you idiot. Get back, get on. And they're, you know, and, and you're basically, you're telling people what, what, what they could easily, you know, the Chinese are up on the top of the hill and they're shooting at us. Of course you can see the shooting at you. And I'm John Alpert for NBC News. And I thought, that was really stupid. Uh, you know, that's not me. And uh, I'm just imitating these people, and I don't like these people. I don't know if you know news correspondents. We have one nice one here. Perry's nice, but all the other ones are. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I, I didn't want to be like them. And so I never did another stand-up. You know? uh, but you used to do kind of a voiceover with well, well, I do, shooting, yeah, right? while I was shooting. So I developed my own style, yeah. and, and it was well-received by people. Uh, because, again, most correspondents are assholes, you know, and they all wear the same exact clothes. They all act the same way. All they care about are the damn stand-ups. They don't give a shit about any of the people that they're doing the stories about. And now, there are exceptions to that. I'm a big, very, very, uh, I'm blanketing. And, and there's some um, very heroic and well-meaning correspondents, which are a lot of idiots. And when people see, like, whatever I looked like, uh, coming with this camera and chirping from behind the camera and willing to go anywhere and you're riding your horse off, okay, I'll get on a horse and I'll ride with you. You're going into that battle? Yeah, let's go into the battle. Um, it, it, we, we began getting access uh, that other people couldn't get. Um, we traveled with small crews compared to uh, the regular news medium and I mean, people liked it. Uh, and because of the background that, that we came from here, in which we didn't think that we were filmmakers or big shot reporters, but we were normal people like everybody else, people liked us a lot better and would share things with us. They, they believed we cared, and we did, and we would stick by them for years, even after the reports were made. Uh, and the things that people would share like, is, is astonished me. I got to the point one day where I began not feel good about what I was doing because people would be dying and we would be right there to capture that. Um, people would be struggling with drug addiction. Uh, we would follow people into jail and they would um, bear their innermost soul and I would never do that with anybody. And I began to feel like a hypocrite. And around this time my family was going through a very serious crisis. My father who is my hero, um, was suffering a, like a, a series of horrific health setbacks. It, it just completely took over the life of our family, uh, transformed uh, life within the family, and it was, it was a rough time. But I thought that the way in which we were dealing with it, especially the way he was dealing with this, was quite heroic. Uh, my mother, too. And I began seeing that everybody's family goes through this. Uh, you know, the golden years are, they're pretty shitty. And I thought that people might benefit from seeing how we dealt with it. So uh, we had a family meeting. And I raised the possibility of making a personal documentary, a documentary about my father, my mother, and how our family was dealing with this. Um, they didn't say yes right away. Uh, but eventually they did, and so that's why I sort of chose this pairing yeah. 
uh, of Jasmine's personal film and the sort of only personal film that I've ever made, mm -hmm. uh, which is called Papa. So by way of introduction, there was a time in which uh, Sheila Evans and I weren't talking to each other. The current film that we're working on, The Life of Crime 3, provoked the feud. Just so people who don't know, Sheila Evans is the head of HBO documentaries for 30 years? For at least 30 years. Uh, yeah. And there was not another game in town. This was rather suicidal for a documentary filmmaker to engage in combat with Sheila. But Sheila had done me wrong. And she had done DCTV wrong. And she'd done us right many times and made very, very important contribution to the prestige and elevation of documentary films. And when we were blacklisted and sitting on the curb licking our wounds, uh, she came by, opened up the door, and, and uh, we rode off with her and began making a series of documentaries for HBO that continues to this day, uh, even in her absence. But she did something really unconscionable, and I wouldn't accept it, and so well, I'm not gonna ever work with you again, and so I wasn't working for anybody. And to her credit, after about two years, she came with a peace offering, and she knew the, how much I loved my father, and um, she knew that I was interested in making the movie that we're going to watch right now, and so she wondered if um, I wouldn't want to make the documentary about my father. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what patched things up with me and Sheila, and I really appreciate that we got the opportunity to do so. It enabled me to absorb uh, another 20 years' worth of uh, <laughs> knock, <laughs> knockout punches from her uh, be, because uh, she, you know, she, she did me a solid by uh, letting me make this film. So the feature, Papa, is about his father after he's been diagnosed with cancer and his slow downturn until he passed away. John is in the film with his entire family and many other people that he knows. It was very emotional watching the film, especially for John. With the movie, we served a cookie, a chicken plate with greens and yellow rice, apricot brandy ice cream, and afterwards, John indulged us with questions. When we had the, uh, the premiere at Channel 13, um, he was too sick to come. And, and I, I, uh, we, we tried to pipe him in, and it wasn't working, uh, it technically, was was too difficult for uh, channel uh, for for HBO to to put us together, um, and then just as we're about ready to start, my father's voice comes in like it's coming in from heaven, and everybody's the the hair stood up uh, on, on on the back of everybody's neck, and uh, he said how happy he was that uh, the film had been made, and he was sorry that he couldn't be with us for the premiere. It, it would have been better if I had um, done this earlier, because my father would have been um, the, the uh, physically fit, vibrant person as opposed to a victim of disease. But within his um, suffering and within his illness, I think uh, his courage and his resolution and personality shine through. Uh, when you get sick, like that, uh, when you have a severe disability, it defines who you are. Uh, and you're not the pilot, you're not the businessman, you're not the father of yours. You're, you're, you're the disability, the disability becomes you. And he's fighting against that uh, in a way that uh, I thought was heroic. And in the making of this film, unified the family during a difficult time. I think you can see uh, aspects of tension and defraying because of the, the pressure of, of, of his illness. And you know, when you have somebody sick in the family for a long, long period of time, it's, it's, it's a real serious burden for everybody. Uh, and it's tough to endure. It's the hardest film I ever had to make. All the other films were easy compared to this. And I think the making of the film, um, everybody understood what was going on. The only person that didn't like it was my Aunt Sonny. Aunt Sonny was um, unhappy with this film because it didn't celebrate her and my father's mother enough in her mind. Um, and so she took offense at the film. So this was the uh, only film that, um, that I've allowed the subjects to have veto power over. And when the edit was complete, we had a family meeting. 
and we all watched it. And I had no idea. You know, I, I kind of thought that we might not come out of that family meeting with the film riding along with us and that the film was going to be done. But both my mom and my dad felt that, um, that it was accurate, respectful, and uh, they were proud to be associated with it. But Aunt Sunny wasn't. She wanted Nana, Nana Beebe fluffed up in the film demanded that she be taken out. And there's one scene in here, you don't know which one it is, but I know which one it is, in which she's a very important cutaway. And I can't get to the next shot without Aunt Sunny being my cutaway. And I had no idea what to do. And this was Aunt Sunny and my mother sitting on the same bench together and I had to blow Aunt Sunny out of the picture. And so the picture loses its uh, resolution, but Aunt Sunny's gone and she's not in the picture. So that was the that was the uh, only objection that we had within the family, and and we discovered stuff. Making you know, I didn't know that my uh, grandfather committed suicide. Nobody knew. And I don't even remember how we got that suicide note, but it came out of some bank box that that we found, and we were all shocked. Speaking of theaters, uh, he he owned the little theater in town, the little movie theater, and we're making a living. I don't know. Um, why he committed suicide, but I know where he committed suicide from that article. And um, he locked up the theater and then went up the steps onto the railroad tracks and, and shot himself. And it's, it's after this film has been made and I want to go see Putnam, Connecticut, where my father was born and where his father committed suicide. And I'm driving around and I look and we're in front of the theater. And so I'm snooping around and I see the stairway going up to the railroad tracks. So I go up there and I'm walking on the railroad tracks and um, it was a very cloudy night, but when I get to this one spot, all of a sudden the clouds open up and the moonlight comes right down onto the tracks where I'm absolutely sure it was where my grandfather killed himself. And it was really, really spooky. And you know me, I'm not that type of person. But all the spirits are swirling around, and everything's tilting, and I, I just sort of don't know how to do this. And we get back in the car, and we're, we're driving home, and I'm talking with Keiko about this, and she says, well, the Japanese have a belief that when you have a restless spirit like this that is sort of wandering around, and somebody finally comes and pays attention to the spirit, you have to be careful because that spirit is going to grab onto you and you don't know what's going to happen and it could be unfortunate. And we're driving our it was like Route 84 and Keiko's driving and I see this car in front of me. I say, Keiko, be careful, be careful. And the car just goes like this and drives itself into us and smashes us and, and this car off the road. And it all seems to be strangely associated with the uh, wandering spirit of my uh, late grandfather. That's what it felt like. The spirit? No, I've had other spirits attach themselves to me <laughs> since then. <laughs> There's a, I, I laid down in, in, in one of the tombs in the pyramids where I wasn't supposed to. Yeah. And all sorts of bad things happened after that. You know, it was like, you know, in Indiana Jones, like when they open up the box they're not supposed to, and I was in the place where I wasn't supposed to, and I paid for it. Yeah, I don't. I would not like to see this often. Seeing it once every 20 years is 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 okay for me. Uh, but I absolutely think of my father every single day. I uh, I, I wear his wedding ring. You know, there's 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 two stories I'll, I'll I'll share with you that aren't in the film. He got sick. And I don't remember what it was, uh, and he, he got hospitalized. And uh, when he got hospitalized, something happened to him mentally, and came to visit him after whatever operation it was. And he's talking to me in French, and he's calling me Frenchy. And you know, he was back in like 1940 and uh, wanting to enlist uh, and fight in World War II. And I was Frenchy, his ally from France. And uh, it was like completely insane. And I said to the nurse, what happened to my father? And she says, uh, does he drink? I said, no, he has two vodka Gibsons a night. She says, every night? And I said, yeah. She says, he's an alcoholic. I said, how can he be? And my father's not an alcoholic. Two drinks a day, you're not an alcoholic. She says, if you become dependent, it could be a half a drink a day. It could be like a sniff of beer a day, uh, you're an alcoholic. And in five days, he'll snap out of it because he's not drinking. 
And I thought, well, this is completely insane. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And the next day, he's in another fantasy world. But it's the fifth day. He's fine. So they, they had been observing this sort of psychotic behavior. And even though he had recovered physically, uh, they decided that he was unfit to go home. And they were going to uh, ship him off to some nursing home with psychiatric care. So I said, um, Dad, you want to go to the nursing home? He says, no. I said, well, we don't want you to go to the nursing home either. But they're, they're, they're forcing us. Will you make me a promise? And he says, what is it? I said, you can never have a drink again. And he never had another drink. Uh, and you know, he was so sad, you know, because he had, like, it, it t sort of typical suburban liquor cabinet. You know, I just took it. I poured everything down the sink. He says, no, no, that bottle's worth $20. This is too bad. <laughs> Devil's brew. You can't do that. That, you know, that's bourbon. No, no, sorry, Dad. <laughs> he never had another drink. And, and he was um, lying on his bed, and I'm passing by, and I hear him and my mother and they're, they're talking to each other in a whisper and crying. And being the sort of prying documentary filmmaker that I am, you know, privacy, privacy is like sort of something to be overcome. <laughs> right. Um, and my father is uh, confessing to my mother that, that he's loved her from, from the first day that he's ever seen her. And he still loves her just as much. And if she really loved him, she would let him go. So that night, they agreed that he could commit suicide. And uh, he had been corresponding with something called the Hemlock Society, which is one of the organizations that helps you commit dignified suicide. And they uh, would send you a cocktail, or they would um, teach you how to put a bag over your, your uh, your head and, and, and suffocate yourself. What I didn't know is that uh, my mother had been intercepting all the correspondence <laughs> <laughs> from the Hemlock Society and throwing it out in the garbage. And so my father kept, well, you know, I, well, you know, am I paying my dues? What's going on here? Why, why aren't they, you know, communicating with me? They were, but he just never got it. So as the eldest son, it was my job now to recontact the Hemlock Society and to get the stuff so that my father could kill himself. And unfortunately, the guy on the phone recognized me. Oh, you're the guy you know, from the, the Today Show, and you're the guy that makes all those films. So I said, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, that made a problem, because then um, they like to operate in the shadows, because um, you know, what they're doing is on the edge of the law. And he says, well, they're going to have to bring this to the board of directors. Uh, but they'll give me an answer in about a week. And so I said, listen, Dad, you know, hang on for a week. Um, you know, I, there shouldn't be any problem. Don't hear anything. Third week, don't hear anything. And now my father, he's really, really in, in, in horrific pain. And nobody should be suffering from the pain he suffers from. And um, although you're not allowed to commit suicide, um, they sort of will medically help you. Uh, by uh, putting you on a morphine pump and uh, increasing the amount of morphine every single day. But it's, it's, it, it's okay for the person who's dying. It's horrible for the family uh, because at some point you detach yourself from the world. You're in this morphine haze. You don't eat, you don't drink. You basically starve yourself to death and it doesn't, you know, it, it's not that pretty. And because my father had been self-medicating -medic himself with different pain medications, uh, he was like an elephant. And the morphine wasn't putting a dent in him. And what should have like taken him to the promised land in about four or five days, he's fine. And I'm trying to break the uh, governor on the morphine pump so that I can increase the dosage. Uh, and I, it takes me a day and I figure out how to do this. Uh, and so like I'm like filling him full of morphine. It's still not doing anything. Uh, and then eventually it began to take effect. But it's unpleasant for the family because you want to be able to have contact and recognition and sort of a, an affirmation of mutual love and you can't have it because the person uh, it drifts off. The only nice thing was that the whole family was able to gather that morning and hold him. Uh, what do we sing? When you walk through the storm, keep your head up. <laughs> so we all held him and he died in our arms while we were uh, so you, could add song. You, you know, the Jewish families 
have a two or three day wake. Uh, it's called sitting shiva, and you sit around, and all the neighbors come, and, and it's it's not quite like Irish wakes. A lot of eating. A lot of not eating, so not not so much drinking. So the Irish would be drinking, and the Jew <laughs> and the Jews and the Jews are eating, and and uh, we're sitting shiva the first night, and the phone rings. It's the guy from the Hemlock Society, mm. and he goes, "Good news." I said, what? He says, we've approved your father. And I said, um, it's too late. He's already dead. And he didn't hear me. He says, good news. You know, we're, we're going to accept your father into the program. And I said, um, listen to me really clearly. You made my family suffer. And you made my father suffer. And what we went through in the past three weeks, no family should have to go through. And you should be ashamed of yourself. We were depending on you to help us, and you did just the opposite. But uh, every February 2nd on my father's birthday, you celebrate him and, and remember him. It's a tragedy to grow old. I mean, it really is. And uh, you know, you could put bows on it and powder on it and stuff like that, but it is what it is. But you know, by making this film and by, by um, uh, seeing how strong my father was in dealing with problems that are worse than anything that I have to deal with right now um, has, has helped me deal with getting older. And I, again, I think it's another example of his courage that uh, he was willing to, 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 to share this particular moment in, in his life cycle. Yeah. This was the only movie that I had in me uh, about the family and um, I, I sort of like the way in which everybody's captured and um, you know we're all putting time in a bottle and and this is the bottle that I'm happy with and I don't want to do it again you know we weren't much of a filmmaking family and I'm not much of a filmmaking filmmaker and when it comes to the family and I've been in this situation which uh, filmmakers have come and they decided that I would be an interesting subject for a movie but I think like I'm already over the the top of the mountain and, and way, way deep down in the valley. And I'm not interested in having anybody uh, uh, document that. I think that uh, my life was really interesting and exciting 20, 30 years ago and would have made a great film, but I'm not interested in anybody making a film about this. That should be enough, don't you think? It's a good thing that people yeah. can't see this, so thank you. So thank you very much for listening to Feature in a Short. Just for something in the forecast to look forward to, even though it's not something we're working on, we actually want to promote advocacy and changing our planet for climate change. And John has a movie coming out called The Last Game that we're very excited to see that is focused around hockey and um, the diminishing of the winter sport because of climate change. He travels around the world like he has in the past for his other documentaries and plays hockey games with local people. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. If you want to contact us, be at the next show, or uh, just have any questions about the podcast, please contact us on social media at 4 Films. That's at F-O-U-R-W-I-N-D-F-I-L-M-S. Thank you very much, and you'll hear from us next time. Peace.